Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us for the third of our Jubilee Talks. Uh, tonight's talk is Imperial Legacies by Seamus Farrell. Seamus has a background in education, in contemporary society, and over 25 years experience working in overseas development and peace education. He's been a consultant and a trainer with the Junction for 20 years now, where the engagement with the inherited narratives of the decade of centenaries and the principles of ethical and shared remembering has developed into a focus on the narratives derived from 500 years of European imperialism, with all of its associated issues of colonialism, slavery, and racism. This brings us to tonight's talk on imperial legacies, where he will examine the Queen's management of colonial history and explore the approaches to revisit and challenge the dominant narratives of the colonial era. So thank you very much, Seamus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. And hello to everyone. Um, uh, my thanks to my colleague at the Junction, Richie Harrington, uh, for managing the PowerPoint so that I don't make it, don't make a mess. <laughs> From our work in peace building at the Junction, a peace building uh, agency, the very strong conviction uh, emerged from the beginning around the extent to which we are where we are today because of where we have come from. Uh, our present circumstances, how we see things, our perception of reality is so much influenced by our past. Quoting the novelist, the American novelist, William Faulkner, who said, the past is not dead, it's not even past. Now, a major focus of the project's work, as Nick has mentioned over the past 10 years, has been on the events of 100 years ago. Uh, militarized opposition to home rule, a militarized Easter rising, events that have cast their shadow over this island ever since. Now, uh, I think I can say that our focus has perhaps not been so much, well, yes, it has been on the events, but more on the sectarianized versions of those events. And meeting when we did about 2010, our concern that those versions would come to underpin the commemoration of those events. And from that perspective, our thoughts was that after a hundred years of these being used to poke each other in the eye, that for these narratives to be used, the narratives of division, as a basis for commemorating our past and centenary events wasn't exactly what our fragile peace process needed. And so we set out in what we called our ethical and shared remembering project to invite people from across our society to come together, to explore the fuller, more complex history of a hundred years ago, the warts and all reality of that time and the close interrelatedness of all those events between 1912 and 22, which traditionally over the century had been remembered by either one community or the other, but never both. As we emerge now from the decade of centenaries culminating in partition, which was the focus of our engagement throughout 2021, Project is beginning to engage with our longer backstory. Specifically, the five centuries of European imperialism, its colonizing of virtually the rest of the world, its establishment of the slave trade, its setting the foundation of <laughs> racism, and of an economic system of exploitation of people and planet that has to be seen, acknowledged as being at the root of our climate and environmental crises. Now those six or seven European empires have all crashed out of history, but we live with the legacy. And we live also with a seriously incomplete history. 
of our history. Whether British or Belgian, Spanish or Portuguese, French or German or Dutch, all of them have understandably sought to tell a fairly benign story about themselves. Stories are heavy perhaps on the heroics of those who bore, quote, the white man's burden, or of bringing, quote, civilization to the rest of the world, and light on the cruelty and the brutality that was a hallmark of all of them. Now, my particular purpose in this talk is to pay tribute to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth for how she has overseen the transition from empire to the new post-imperial reality and done so with grace and in a spirit of conciliation. And more about that and on, of course. But in order to do that, I think I need, first of all, to say something about the story of empire from which she, in her 70 year long reign, has overseen transition. And it's a big territory. What I'd like to do here is focus specifically on the imperial legacy in relation to the island of Ireland. I suggest that there is a dominant narrative on this island that presents it from beginning to end as victim of empire, from being Britain's first overseas colony and going from there. But the truth is more complex, given the significant role of the Irish of both major traditions and of all religious beliefs, in the expansion of the British Empire as army officers, soldiers, senior administrators of colonial rule. So to put it as briefly as possible, Ireland's part in imperial history is to say the least ambiguous. Because this island is part of the continent of geographically of Europe, it is not of Asia or not of Africa or South America. We, the people who inhabit this island, are net beneficiaries today of the wealth that flowed into Europe from its colonial enterprises. We still enjoy the legacy of affluence that derives from the exploitation of elsewhere. But, and I say this as a major reason why we need to be aware of all this, is that all the signs are there, that the days of the West sitting atop the world, enjoying the fruits of the imperial era, are coming to an end as the center of gravity of the world in economic and political and power structures it's beginning to move east to China and India. So I cite that as one reason for exploring the legacy of imperialism, knowing where we've come from to help us navigate where we're going. Right, the bigger narrative, the warts and all history of European imperialism is now beginning to emerge. Uh, the stories of those whose experience was at the receiving end of it unwillingly. Stories that present a not so benign picture of imperial history, these are cascading towards us now. Now, being challenged to revisit our version of empire is difficult, it's even painful. We have already seen the more complete, more honest histories that are surfacing being met with pretty virulent accusations of distortion of history. Uh, that was the reaction in the Daily Mail to the toppling of the statue of Edward Colston in Bristol in June 2020. Uh, but there was no distortion. There can be, there is no distortion in calling out slave trader Colston for having trafficked hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children from Africa to the Americas in the 17th century. 
and for being a pedophile and a misogynist book, the toppling of his statue from a plinth whose inscription spoke of his, quote, virtue, and it's dunking into the harbour, provoked cries of outrage. Now, those who were charged with it were found not guilty and released much to the anger of government and others. And at the time of the Bristol affray, the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter campaign was at its height and attention turned also to the statues of Winston Churchill in London and Cecil Rhodes in Oxford. Nearer to home, we have the McGarrell Town Hall in Larne. Charles McGarrell was the owner of Mahara Morn House. On his elevation to the House of Lords, he took the title Lord Mahara Morn. He owned a thousand slaves. Now, at the time of the abolition of slavery by the Westminster Parliament, the British government decided to give compensation. They set up a compensation scheme for slave owners for the consequent loss of property and income. Charles McGarrell received 81,000 pounds in compensation, which in today's money would amount to 9.7 million pounds. So I suppose you could say he, was well, he could well afford to build the town hall in Larne. Down the road a bit in Newry, we have the statue of John Mitchell, described by Porrick Pierce as he of the Easter Rising, as a fierce and sublime apostle of Irish republicanism. In America, to which he went into exile, he was in fact a slave owner and an uncompromising pro-slavery pro -slavery advocate, a supporter of the Confederates who fought to retain slavery in the American Civil War. So here are versions of history needing to be revisited. We do want our versions of history to stay the way they are, but we do need to be ready for their being challenged. Now, I've referred already to a dominant narrative that focuses on Ireland as victim of empire, as Britain's first overseas colony, the brutal suppression of resistance, suppression of religion, language and culture, and a population at the mercy of big houses, landlords. Then the famine coinciding with Ireland being the island being a net food exporter, all of which and more is to be acknowledged. But those stories have been told. Among the things that are also part of that history are the huge numbers of those from this island who served in the British Imperial Army across the centuries, culminating in those who went off to fight in World War I those of both traditions who served the empire in diplomatic and administrative posts, which kept the empire oiled and running. There were the medics, the teachers and others who worked across the global empire, establishing health and education services. There were the churches, plural, from Ireland, who even managed on the back of empire to create their own ecclesiastical empires overseas. And there were those who resisted empire. Now in this session, because it's a big story, I'd like to offer a small sample of Irish people who served empire. To offer, if you like, pen pictures of people born in this island, between them being of Roman and reformed religious backgrounds, who played a huge part in British imperial history. I hope this might help introduce a sense of Ireland's history in relation to empire being rather more ambiguous than the simple victim-based narrative. So we begin with Viscount Castle Ray otherwise known as the Marcus of Londonderry. His big house was at Mount Stuart in the Ards Peninsula. 
he was born Robert Stewart in Dublin. He became Chief Secretary for Ireland, a Presbyterian but passionately opposed to the radical Presbyterianism of those of his contemporaries who established the United Irishmen and who led the failed 1798 rebellion. All of those were contemporaries of his. And some of those who worked on his estate in Mount Stewart were United Irishmen and he sought to get rid of them. One of those was his own clergy person, the Reverend Robert Porter. Porter was tried and hanged in front of the Presbyterian meeting house in the village of Grey Abbey, Grey Abbey close to Mount Stewart. <coughs> Between 1812 and 1822, Lord Castlereagh was British Foreign Secretary, a key player at the Congress of Vienna. When, well, the Napoleonic Wars had come to an end and the reconstruction of Europe in the wake of Napoleon uh, was required. And Castlereagh has to be named as the key person, I think, in brokering a peaceful settlement that held in Europe, with the exception of the Franco-Prussian War, until World War I. And he is probably the greatest British Foreign Secretary ever. No British statesperson has reached the same level of international influence. He could even be recognised as Britain's greatest European, but that's not without his ironies at present. He developed, however, signs of paranoia and what could be described as a pretty serious nervous breakdown. He confided to a few people that he feared prosecution for his homosexuality, which at that time was a crime. And tragically, at half seven on the 12th of August, 1822, Castlereagh was found dead in his dressing room, having cut his throat. So a very tragic end for a giant of British imperialism and of European politics. Next to George McCartney, born 1737, from a Protestant family that had settled and lived at Lissanur near Loch Gil, in County Antrim. I think that, that is Causeway Coast, isn't it? Yeah. He became a top ranking British colonial administrator and diplomat, made a huge contribution to British Empire. And after negotiating a British Russian alliance with Catherine the Great of Russia, and then for a time serving as Chief Secretary for Ireland, King George III singled him out on a mission to open up trade with the Chinese government in Beijing. At a diplomatic meeting in Paris before that, it was in fact George McCartney who actually coined the well-known now expression of an empire on which the sun never sets. Those are his words. So he arrived in China as representative of the power of the British Empire laden with gifts to the Chinese emperor, but the emperor was dismissive, to put it mildly, of both the visitors and their gifts, telling King George in a letter that he sent back with them that his delegate had had a long journey for nothing. Now, then McCartney's, you could have to say, mission was not a success, but he did bring back a lot of information on China information that was to prove invaluable very shortly afterwards in Britain's taking control of large parts of China, particularly the recognition that China, that the empire in China, because it didn't really have any serious external enemies, a lot of internal ones, but that its naval defenses were very weak. And that brings us immediately to Sir Henry Pottinger. Born into the family big estate called Mount Pottinger in East Belfast. Educated at Belfast Royal Academy. 
as a young person, he joined the East India Company, which effectively was a trading company managing empire on behalf of Britain. And in 1841, he set off from India for China, having been given responsibility for establishing British trade with China. Uh, it was he who led Britain's gunboat diplomacy, blasting the Chinese into submission. He had ironclad craft and they had little wooden, uh, little wooden canoes. Now he, that blasted the Chinese into submission in the first opium war to be followed by a second. And that opened up Britain's possibility of expanding its trade to China in opium. Opium, which Indian and especially Bengali peasants had been forced by the East India Company to grow. And now the major place of export was to be China. It destroyed millions of lives and resulted in colossal revenue for the British coffers. In 1842, he negotiated the Treaty of Nanking, but like Nanking and subsequent treaties, it could hardly be called a treaty. It was an imposed, it was imposed. That opened up five additional ports in China to the British opium trade. He also received Hong Kong from the Chinese as a permanent colony. A Chinese attempt at one point to curb the opium trade by setting fire to uh, a consignment of the stuff. The fine was 21 million and it was secured by Pottinger. He became the first governor of Hong Kong and later he was a member of the, Royal, of the British Privy Council. There is a plaque to Pottinger in the St. George Parish Church in High Street in Belfast, which I think you might say is an innocent piece. He features on the website of his old school, but you can hardly tell hundreds of school kids that one of the school's most famous pupils was perhaps the biggest international drug trade, drug, drug dealer on the planet. So there's no mention of that. The engagement of McCartney and Pottinger in China marks the start of a century of a repeated and brutal humiliation of China by Western empires, not just British, although you could say perhaps especially the British, culminating in the decision in 1919 at the Paris Conference after the Great War, when Chinese in their thousands had dug the trenches and buried dead bodies on the Western Front, and who had hoped that as a result of their joining with the Allies in the Great War, that China might get, might get back its province of Shandong, which until the First World War was controlled by the German Empire. The Treaty of Versailles did not give it to China. It gave the province of Shandong to Japan. That century of humiliation is etched deep in the transgenerational memory of the Chinese people and how it will be expressed in the years ahead remains to be seen. Another uh, going south in the island now, Reginald, General Reginald Dyer, born in India but educated in Cork, on returning to India, he joined the Bengal army. He was a rabid imperialist, absolutely convinced that British rule in India was by the will of God. And on the 13th of April, 1919, he ordered soldiers to open fire on a Sikh religious festival in Amritsar, killing thousands. It continued until the soldiers ran out of ammunition. Now, in fact, that actually galvanized Indian nationalism. I think now we're looking back, the Amritsar massacre can be seen as a stepping stone 
on India's road to independence. Dyer became known as the butcher of Amritsar. Uh, and he had to be retired out of the army, but he retained his status in high circles in London. He uh, strongly supported by his Irish colleagues, including Sir Edward Carson, received a military funeral in 1827, and his coffin was draped in the Union flag that had flown over his headquarters back in India, and it was escorted by the Irish cards. Rudyard Kipling wrote glowing tributes to him. Another Tipperary man at the same time, Sir Francis Michael O'Dwyer, born 1864 in County Tipperary. Uh, two of his brothers served in the empire in India. And he had two other brothers who became Jesuit priests. He became Lieutenant Governor General of the Punjab. He imposed martial law and was fully behind General Dyer's actions at Amritsar. Like his fellow Irishman Dyer, he believed that British imperial rule was absolutely essential for India, that Indians, no matter how well educated, were unfit for political leadership. Only the colonial rule of what he called, quote, despotic paternalism would do. Now, he too, like his fellow countryman Dyer, was criticized by the British Secretary of State for India, Edward Montagu. Montagu was a member of the Jewish community and that led to a very anti-Semitic response from O'Dwyer. That's what you get for having a Jew in Whitehall. He retired to the West Country in England, but stayed very much involved with the whole association of the East India Company back in England. At a meeting of the association in Westminster uh, on the 13th of March, he was shot dead by Saddam Singh in retaliation for the Amritsar massacre. And Singh's later death, that date has become a, a national holiday in the Punjab. Um, just a quick mention to when we're in India, a connection between Ireland and India that's often mentioned is the laying down of arms by soldiers of the Connaught Rangers serving in India uh, during the Anglo-Irish War, War of Independence. Um, the Connaught Rangers were the preferred regiment for men from the Belfast Nationalist Catholic community and wide, more widely, even though their base was Galway. On hearing of the atrocities being committed by the Black and Tan forces in Ireland during the Anglo-Irish War in 1919 20 three units refused to obey orders. The leader of the mutiny was court-martialed, one of them, James Daly, was executed. But another story about the Connaught Rangers. They were very much a part of the British Army's suppression of Indian resistance to British rule. And they had a reputation, which has been mentioned in dispatches and so on, that the Connaught Rangers were among the most feared and hated unit of the army with a reputation for shooting first and asking questions later. Okay, we come now to Sir Roger Casement, Protestant, educated at a church school in Valamina, joined the public service and became the British consul to the Congo Consul being the equivalent, effectively, of ambassador. Congo, British Belgian Congo at the time, uh, was officially part of the British of uh, the Belgian Empire, but it was regarded by their king Leopold as his personal property, and he had trade. He he organized exploitation of anyway. In 1904. Casement exposed the atrocious cruelty and the exploitation of native labor by white traders in the Congo. It's estimated that as many as 12 million Congolese perished in appalling abuses by Belgian companies. 
his expose led to a major reorganization of Belgian rule in the Congo. Effectively, the Belgian government took over from the king. But less well known as regards Casement is that he also exposed Spanish imperial atrocities in the Putumayo River region of Peru, part of the Amazon basin. And in fact, it was that report which earned him his knighthood. Now, he was known to have always sympathized with the, with, had a sympathy for Irish nationalism. For whatever reason, whether it was his experiences in Congo and Peru as to what empires can do or, or whatever, he set off to Germany before the World War, at the beginning, before World War I started to try to persuade them to land an expeditionary force on the west coast of Ireland to coincide with and to support the Easter Rising. Germany didn't buy the idea, but they did send a shipment of arms, but British intelligence got wind of the shipment and the German captain scuttled the ship off the Kerry coast. Casement himself came ashore from a German submarine on Banna Strand near Tralee, County Kerry, but was arrested on April 24th taken to London, and on June 29th, he was convicted of treason and sentenced to death. There were numerous appeals by influential Englishmen to grant him a reprieve in view of his past services to empire, but those fell on deaf ears. He was hanged on the 3rd of August, 1916, at Pentonville. Um, so someone who had fought with bravery and determination against the enslavement of indigenous people in the Congo was in the end executed by the empire that had commissioned to do it and had knighted him in fact for his services. There was a darker side to Roger Casement, diaries reportedly written by him containing detailed descriptions of homosexual practices were circulated privately among British officials. Homosexuality was unlawful at the time of course and the diaries were a key factor in his death sentence because the political case against him was weak enough. Some historians suggest there's evidence that they were faked, but since their release in 1959, I think the consensus is that there has been the idea that the passengers in question were Casement's handwriting. Just a closing point and then we'll break. It's interesting to compare the treatment of Casement with that of Fred Crawford, who organized the alarm gun running for the UVF. Just as Casement was involved in the Hoth Harbor gun run uh, on behalf of the Irish volunteers. Um, Crawford and his colleagues were arming an illegal army to fight the British army if need be, uh, to fight uh, you know, for their own corner of empire, uh, while Casement was fighting for independence from it. Crawford was never questioned or brought in for any kind of interrogation. Casement was executed. And Edward Craw uh, Crawford, Fred Crawford, was given a seat in the House of Lords. Okay, folks, uh, look, I've done a quick race through Irish people uh, who featured in the story of empire. And I do want to come and later to talk about, pay tribute to Queen Elizabeth in respect to what she has done in her approach to colonial history. But for now, could we maybe take a break and as I say, an opportunity for people to just simply take a break, or if people have questions, comments, observations, and criticisms of anything you've heard, please, I'd like to hear. And um, can I leave it to yourself, uh, Nick, to, Keep an eye out for hands raised, if any. Certainly you can. Um, that was very interesting, Seamus, and I, I'm looking forward to hearing the second part of the, the talk as well. Uh, are there any questions at this point from, uh, or any observations at this point that anyone like to, to give? At the risk of... Uh, uh, of giving too many examples, of course, there are quite a few other examples from from Ireland generally, but certainly from the Causeway Coast and Glens uh, area that you could add to your list 
of Irishmen in the service of empire uh, this as well. Yes, indeed. Um, it, of course, every time you drive down the, the, uh, the road through Ross Trevor on the way to Warren Point and Valley Castle, you pass by Ross's monument to, uh, I think it was a major general, and he was the, the Irish officer responsible for burning down the, the White House in 1812. So that, that's still in the service of empire, if uh, yeah. in a slightly yeah. different context. Yes. Um, but many of the big house families on the North Coast had generations of involvement with the East India Company, especially. Yeah. Um, to the point that you have uh, Hayes McNaughton, who was arguably responsible for the first Anglo-Afghan war. Um, and then you had Boyd's and Gage's uh, involved very much with the East India Company. Yes. Um, we have recently been doing a study into, into family histories and local histories in the Ballycastle area and have uncovered also Boyd involvement with uh, the African country and with plantations in the Caribbean and slave ownership in the same way that you were talking about uh, with, was it Robert Stewart down at Mount Stewart? And they yes. also seem to have been compensated. Uh, uh, Charles Begarl, yeah. yeah. So, no, it, it's very interesting and not something that's often discussed. Uh, so I'm delighted that you've been able to, to raise that here. Does anyone have out, uh, anybody else have anything to, to add at this point? Uh, Mick and Christine have said, in school in the North, I learned only the positive activities of the British. In the Irish schools, uh, in the Irish schools, were they taught about the nefarious activities of the great men and their deeds? Um, Christine, I'm not. Uh, I think it's Christine, isn't it? Uh, ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. Well, I think I would imagine that the history, as taught in the Free State now Republic of Ireland would have uh, been antagonistic probably towards empire. But one of, the, one of the things that has emerged from our research at the junction is that with only really one exception, Daniel O'Connell, among the pantheon of liberators in the Irish nationalist story, that all of them were imperialists. I've already mentioned John Mitchell as one, but um, the assumption was, is, has been kind of that they, that those who are about the liberation uh, of Ireland uh, would have had a sense of affinity with the, uh, those of African and Asian, African and Asian, who had been colonized also. But it isn't so. Daniel O'Connell made friends with uh, a, an escaped slave, Frederick Douglass, who had a very big influence upon him. And he became, he went to the States in order to push <clears throat> for the abolition of slavery. <clears throat> and in fact, he got very short shift from the Irish in America because. Um, the possibility that African slaves might be freed from their slavery might then be able to be on a par with Irish Americans struggling to get to the first rung of the ladder out of their poverty. Um, the Irish Americans, they did not entertain O'Connell very well <laughs> as a result. Thank you, Seamus. Anybody else? Anything to say at this point? No, very good. Uh, Seamus, are you happy? Okay, to we'll go on. Yes, and just I'm very aware. This is uncomfortable material. Uh, but as you said, Nick, and I think this is something we need to hear, we need to know because 
we are in a very changing world. And um, where we have come from is going to have a bearing on our process of navigating our way to a future. So we at the junction are not doing this in order to render people uncomfortable, but to, we feel here is material that needs to be talked about. Anyway, okay. Let me now come to the tribute I wish to pay to Queen Elizabeth. With respect to her approach to colonial history, throughout her reign, but most crucially right now, as the dominant narratives around empire are beginning to be subjected to rigorous scrutiny, Queen Elizabeth has overseen the transition from empire to the new post-imperial reality with grace and, with, and in the spirit of conciliation that has enabled relationships across this island within the Commonwealth and beyond to be so much the better for all that she has done. Uh, Queen Elizabeth is the great, great granddaughter of the Empress of India, Queen Victoria. She carried the weight of history into our reign, beginning in 1952. Now, 1952, just four years later, after she came to the throne, the British Empire, the date for the collapse of the British Empire is taken to be the deeply humiliating defeat of British and French forces at Suez in 1956. And the humiliation and the, the defeat at Suez was followed by the rapid departure of its last remaining colonies uh, in Africa, one after the other in very quick succession. All of them had become independent by 1968, except Southern Rhodesia, present day Zimbabwe. Now, there is much to be gained from a study of the Queen's speeches and her arduous efforts, often in very difficult and delicate moments during visits to Commonwealth countries, on the occasion of Commonwealth heads of state visits to London, individually and at Commonwealth gatherings. During all of those, to read her speeches, how she sought to foster new and healed relationships. Can't go into them all in a session short as this. I'd like to focus on two engagements that involved not Commonwealth members, but former colonies that cut their ties with empire by becoming republics. And I'm singling these out uh, because of the important speeches, well, first of all, made by Queen Elizabeth herself in Dublin, and the other by the Prince of Wales in Barbados only a few months ago. I refer then to the Queen's visit to the Republic of Ireland in May 2011, and to the visit of Prince Charles to Barbados in November of last year. Clearly delivering a message on behalf of Her Majesty, I'm talking about the Prince of Wales speech last year, uh, clearly delivering a message on behalf of uh, his mum. It was the occasion was uh, Caribbean Island's decision to remove the Queen as its head of state and declare itself a republic. Okay, so to Dublin, May 2011, and there is a photograph on the screen. She was the first monarch to visit the republic since her grandfather, King George V in 1911. It was exactly 100 years. And against the background of the IRA's assassination of Lord Mountbatten in 1979, the Queen delivered what has ever since been regarded as one of the best speeches ever in the political diplomatic arena. And it is known that she wrote the speech herself. She began with a greeting in Irish and referred as well to 
the link between our people that makes us so much more than just neighbors. And she went on. It is impossible to ignore the weight of history. So much of this visit reminds us of the complexity of our history, its many layers and traditions, but also the importance, and I think it's important, of forbearance and conciliation, of being able to bow to the past, but not be bound by it. She went on, the relationship has not always been straightforward, nor has the record over the centuries been entirely benign. To all those who have suffered as a consequence of our troubled past, I extend my sincere thoughts and deep sympathy. With the benefit of historical insight, we can all see things which we would wish had been done differently or not at all. So I'd like to repeat the two bits of that, to be able to bow to the past, but not be bound by it. This from a woman who lost a very, very close friend and relative in the IRA campaign, and subsequently shook hands with Martin McGuinness. I suggest that these are much more than conciliatory words. They're a model of conciliatory practice. And a model too, for the acknowledgement of history's complexity of the things that we can now see, which we wish had been done differently or not at all. Barbados last year, 30th of November, and as I've hinted already, I have absolutely no doubt, but that the Prince of Wales either checked out his speech with his mother or received it from her. Speaking in front of a crowd at National Hero Square, previously known as Trafalgar Square in Bridgetown, the capital of Barbados, Prince Charles said, from the darkest days of our past and the appalling atrocity of slavery, which forever stains our histories, the people of this island have forged their path with extraordinary fortitude. Perhaps just there to add a little bit about an Irish connection with Barbados that's not very well known, between 1652 and, 19, and 1659, that was the Cromwellian time, over 50,000 Irish men, women and children were transported to Barbados and to Virginia uh, on, in present day the United States. Now, whether they were indentured uh, with the possibility of eventual freedom or not, all of them on the ground were slaves assigned to the cotton and sugar plantations and subject to the same cruelty as black African slaves. It's a story we don't know very well, one reason being that the records from the time that were housed by the British administration in the Four Courts building in Dublin were all destroyed in 1922 when the anti-treaty forces set fire to the building at the start of the Civil War. But some records are in the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and are now being researched. Anyway, that's a little bit of an aside. The journey to a more honest history of how we in Europe came to be where we are is going to be a long and a challenging journey. And it will require leadership. And I say this, in the awareness that if we are expecting leadership from a political establishment, I suspect we will wait. Members of the present cabinet were, as I recall, not exactly behind the door in response to the raising of questions about great figures of British imperial history during the anti-racism protests or against the killing of King of George Floyd. There is resistance against those raising questions about history as we have been taught it. We hope Her Majesty can be with us for longer, but I'd like to suggest that she can remain forever as our guide throughout. 
And Brexit had multiple drivers, one of which I think has to be acknowledged as having been about uh, using racism as an argument for. But I do believe that one of them was nostalgia for the days of empire and they're not maybe having come to terms with the loss of it. I think it can be seen in the slogans, take back control, global Britain, etc. Now, I only mention it here because of a moment that must have been very distressful for Her Majesty. In order to, quote, get Brexit done, Jacob Rees-Mogg and two colleagues arrived at Balmoral Castle in August 2019 requiring Her Majesty to sign a document that would allow Parliament to be prorogued, i.e. discontinued, so that a vote could be avoided. It's clear now that the Queen felt she had no option but to sign it. Besides its contempt for democracy, I think it treated the monarchy as little more than an ornamental or a decorative entity. And both monarchy and democracy were saved only by the intervention of the Supreme Court, declaring that asking the Queen to prorogue Parliament was unlawful. Now, however much of fantasy it attached to any hopes of an empire, Mark II, I think that too is a mindset that will strongly resist any revisiting of the inherited narratives of the first one. There is a task to be undertaken. I'm thinking in particular of the task facing historians, the custodians of archives who would wish to be generous and helpful towards historians, curators of museums, of course, and wearing my teacher's hat, those with responsibility for the history curriculum in formal education. And I want to suggest that for all of these, for all of us, Queen Elizabeth serves as a model of authentic engagement with our history. In spite of being, I think, encased in a somewhat unreal world of pomp and procedure, she has retained her values of integrity and ethics. Of willingness, however painful, to insist that there is no set of rules for the elite, such as her son, and another for others. It now transpires that when Prince Philip died on the 5th of April last year, number 10 contacted Buckingham Palace to offer an easement of restrictions to the palace for the funeral. The Queen declined on the grounds that it would be unfair to others who, like her, were grieving in lockdown. And the palace told Downing Street that the Queen wanted to set an example rather than be an exception to the rules. While she did receive an apology for the booze up and said Downing Street uh, on the eve of her husband's funeral, I suppose for me personally, it is the hope that the Jubilee year will provide opportunity, not just for the issuing of cheap words of apology, but for the following of her example. And I think especially in high places. Okay, I have expressed personal opinions here in an attempt to pay a personal and very, very heartfelt tribute to Her Majesty. It's my tribute to a most honorable lady. And I'll finish at that. Okay. Thank you so much, Seamus, uh, for that. And, and very heartfelt. Um, does anybody have anything that they would like to add at this point? Or any questions for Seamus? Uh, yeah, Maureen. Yeah, I, I suppose by way of comment or a, a question in this Jubilee year, Seamus, um, we heard Macron talking about the temporary or permanent restitution of African patrimony to Africa. 
And on the back of that, the Elysee Palace said, African heritage can no longer be the prisoner of European museums. Is there something about a generosity of the treasures that were created through empire for the British that the Queen could have a generous a generosity in returning some of the treasures that are, that are held in Britain that could be returned to those former colonies? Yeah, thanks, Maureen. I'm aware that the Benin statues, Nick may be able to correct me on this, but that the Benin treasury, memorabilia treasury has been returned to Nigeria uh, in recent. And there's talk about the, the uh, what are they called? The Parthenon marbles. Uh, yeah. Oh dear, there's a name which is attached to the guy who took them out of Greece and brought them. That, that would be the, the Elgin. Model. Elgin. Elgin, yeah. yeah. Anyway, they were taken from the Parthenon. Sorry, that's maybe not. Um, I don't know, is, is Her Majesty in a position to effect the transfer of um, such things from England, from Britain, back? Perhaps a related issue, Maureen, is the issue of Retro of of remuneration or apology, apo you know, Germany made a huge contribution, made made a big apology verbally anyway, associated with some financial assistance to Namibia, mm -hmm. and I think Britain did yes at the time in relation to the Mao the suppression of the Mao Mao uprising in Kenya, there was an apology accompanied by. A contribution to the Kenyan government. Um, but there needs to be more, I think. I'm thinking uh, of the newer diamond, is that what you call it from India? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I mean, sure, Dave, yeah. Where is it held? Do you know, Mar? I think that that's in the, uh, the uh, British. It's not the museum what you, where they hold it in the Tower of London, isn't it? The Newer Diamond? Yes. I, if it's the one I'm thinking of, that's part of the Crown Jewels, isn't it? So yeah, that would be, yeah. that, be in the Tower. Yeah. Yeah, in the Tower of London, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just feeling in this year of the Jubilee, such generosity, and if the Queen were to head that up, it would yes. be very hard for the British government to turn that down. Yeah, yeah, there's an idea. Thanks, mine. Just a, a comment. It's um, over the shenanigans of government in the in the last while. It sort of defies belief that somebody should be suggesting a global Britain, and with, with that idea of nostalgia and lost powers and, and so on. When everything else that is being done is really uh, pushing everybody away and, and making ourselves or making the UK smaller, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't get my head around this idea of global Britain. Uh, what, what fantasies do, do people have, whether they're in government and followed Presumably by a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of people. It's yeah, 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 yeah. I don't have an answer either, Christine. Um, I think the nostalgia is understandable, but I think the challenge will be now to revisit the story and befriend the complex reality. Mm of imperial history. Mm. And until that is done, I suppose, nostalgia will prevail. I think it behoves all of us within the confines of where our lives are at or whether we're working or not working, you know, to, to bring up these topics in, in discussion where, where possible, even if they're difficult to do and very challenging, really to and encourage people to look at the past in a more critical way and to push to have that uh, critical representation brought into the, the schools, uh, you know, in, into how history is taught because, 
yeah, <clears throat> sometimes as older people, we, we feel a bit removed from what, what is happening and a bit helpless. But um, I, I think somehow it behoves all of us in our small ways to keep the conversation going and to challenge thoughts. Yes, yes. At the junction, we are convinced about all of this. And just an important point to make is we are not in the business of passing judgment on people of another time. They were people of their time, of their context. And who's to say that if I were not, uh, you know, born in India and you know, a white person born in India and back in the East India Company, that I would not be as determined as people like General Dyer and O'Dwyer were uh, to keep, to maintain control. So it is not about judgment of people of our past, uh, but like with that understanding that we are not passing judgment, I do think we have to journey with big, big questions now and, uh, and to ask how in consequence of what happened then, do we deal with the reality now? It's about the future, I think, as much as about the past. That's, I suppose that's where we come from. Thank you so much, uh, Seamus. And, and as you say, it's not about passing judgment so much as giving, I think you said it earlier, the what's and all treatment and then put, putting history in context so that we can better understand it, not, not to excuse it or, or condemn it so much, um, yeah. but so we can understand and learn for, from it. Yes. Yes. If there are no other questions, um, I will stop the recording and say thank you again to Seamus.